Hello, and welcome to the Farm Traveler podcast. This is episode 14. Our guest today is Joe Lample of Joe Gardner, and also he is the creator, executive producer, and host of Growing a Greener World. Today, Joe's going to talk to us all about home gardening, how we got into it, tips and tricks that he has. He's got some great knowledge about using mulch, about starting your own compost pile, and all that really cool stuff. And he's also got a really cool um, idea on getting rid of weeds, which may or may not include a flamethrower. Um, And don't forget, we are also doing our Yeti giveaway. You have until next week, which is when we're going to announce the winner. So all you've got to do is follow us on Instagram, farm underscore traveler, and then leave a written review on our iTunes podcast page. Last week we had about six, and this week we've got nine reviews, which is awesome. So we're slowly moving up. Thank you all very much. So we will announce the winner next week during episode 15. And you will, the winner, will get a Yeti tumbler, a little 14-ounce one, which is great. So again, this is episode 14 with Joe Lample of JoeGardner.com. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Farm Traveler podcast, Joe Lample. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much, Trevor. Man, I was browsing Instagram one day just trying to find guests, and I stumbled upon your page that had several thousand followers. And I was like, oh man, this is this is like a big guy. And so I, I messaged <laughs> you, and we've been emailing back and forth. So I'm, I'm very happy that you're on the podcast, so thank you for being on. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you are a big-time gardener. You've got a show on PBS, right? Growing a Greener World. Yep. You've also yep. got the Joe Gardner Show, which I believe just had its 100th episode. And I was, list- I was on a few flights a couple weeks back, listening to a whole bunch of your episodes, getting some good tips on starting a spring <laughs> garden. So good. Uh, if you can, walk us through kind of how your start in gardening happened and what mm-hmm. you've been up to the past couple of years. <laughs> okay. How long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> However long it needs to be. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief and not put people to sleep. But I grew up in Miami, Florida, youngest of four boys. And so, you know, when I'm eight years old or so, and, I, you know, I follow my dad around the yard on Saturdays while he did the mowing and the clipping and all of that because my older brothers were off doing their own thing and they didn't want to hang with their little brother. So I'm following my dad around, just kind of paying attention to what he does. And um, he was not a gardener, just kind of the weekend warrior guy. And then at the end of the day, this one Saturday, he went into the house and had spent all day cleaning up the yard, making it look great and trimming the bushes. And I'm still running around out there. I've got energy left in me. And I ran by one of his bushes that he just got through trimming and I broke a branch off of it. And I said, Oh no, what do I do now? You know, I didn't want to get caught or get in trouble. So what does any eight year old guy do with that? He takes that branch, he shoves it in the ground right next to the base of the plant and covers his tracks with extra soil and hopes that he doesn't get discovered. And I went about my business, but about, um, I don't know, eight to 10 weeks later, I went back by that plant, just happened by it. And remember that's where it happened. That was the scene of the crime, but I couldn't find the, uh, the dead branch. Because it had re-sprouted. And I thought, wait a minute, that's the branch I broke. And I looked at it, new leaves are coming out. And I'm thinking, how can this be? What the heck is going on here that this thing is reviving itself? And honestly, that was the moment that I tell everyone I was hooked on horticulture. Because I was so fascinated by that that I just had to know more. I started propagating plants and doing everything. I was growing roses and vegetables and you know, selling plants at church bazaars. And I started a mowing business and a little nursery business. And I I never stopped. And I got busier every year, got, you know, studied horticulture and business and then came out of school on the business side of the equation. But then I got picked up as the, uh, to be the host of DIY Networks Fresh from the Garden. It was a new show that was being started on a sister station to HGTV on how to grow your own food from seed to harvest. And every episode was going to feature one particular crop. So let's just say one episode was going to be all about tomatoes, how to start seed or seedlings, and then all the care and attention all the way to the harvest. So somebody that wanted to know how to grow tomatoes, they could watch that show and everything they needed to know, more or less, was in that show. And so it would take like four or five months to film an episode, but we would do that for every kind of crop you could grow in the home garden. And what was supposed to be one year and 26 episodes turned into three years and 52 episodes because the show, people really loved the show. It was, inter- you know, it was educational and entertaining and it was going well. So they extended it as long as they could. And they wanted to keep it going even longer if we could come up with new uh, things to grow without repeating anything we already had done. And after 52 episodes, what the heck can you grow that you can eat that we haven't already covered? 
So after that, I was picked up for another three years on another PBS show, and then I decided I was going to create my own show because I felt like there was a void in the uh, broadcast industry for gardening education to inspire new gardeners to the um, for the love of gardening or growing their food. It just I just felt like the people that were in, in the TV business really didn't understand horticulture or gardening or how to connect that audience, and I did because that was my true background, and I, I was a gardener that got into that happened into the TV business rather than these TV people happening into the gardening side to create a gardening show. So I came at it from a, more of an authentic side from the true knowledge of horticulture and farming and gardening. So I created this show called Growing a Greener World, and that was t- literally 10 years ago, uh, or 11 really, because we're in our 10th season this year, and it's all over the country, and it's on public television. And uh, along the way, I, I uh, people wanted to know more than just the 30 minutes a week that they were getting on Growing a Greener World. So I had a lot of content from a brand I started even before the television show called Joe Gardner. So I revived JoeGardner.com, and that became the online source for all this other gardening information where we could go deeper. And I I created my podcast show, which is, like you said, just over 100 episodes now and coming up on a million downloads. And, um, you know, it it was where we could really reach a newer audience that was really into the digital side or not into TV so much, but they were still watching video and listening to podcasts or reading, you know, blog posts and on social media, but they just weren't doing television. And I, too, am more of that person than a TV person as far as how I consume information. So it, I was particularly attracted and passionate more about the digital side. So that's that's where the second half of my life lives and, and, um, or the other side of the time that I spend every day, really, is how I should say that, is uh, creating more, or focusing more on the digital side. Because the television side, it's year-round, but our production season is typically from about right now until into October, and then we're not on the road so much. But all the while, the Joe Gardner side is uh, up and running every day like crazy. So there you go. That's my life in a nutshell, and, and hopefully that didn't put people to sleep. <laughs> no, that's great. That's such a cool story. Um, yeah, that's crazy that whenever you cut that, that branch off and you planted it, I mean, like, you were doing an experiment and you just didn't know about it. That's so cool. Well, um, and I love experiments. Yeah. That's what ha- that was the first of many, many experiments after that. Oh, I can imagine. That's so cool. Yeah, I grew up. My dad had a nice yard, nice plants, the whole shebang. But I always wanted to mow the grass. But I would yeah. always ask him. He would say, "Son, this is my thing. When you have your own lawn, you can mow it." And so I finally uh, have my own lawn, and I can mow it, and it's great. It's like a good. dream come true. Yep. <laughs> I know our podcast kind of focus on the ag industry, but they don't think about horticulture. But it's such a huge aspect of the ag industry because everybody has plants in their yard. Everybody has a lawn and it's so important it's a billion dollar industry in the ag industry yeah and it's so cool that you found like a niche with people that are wanting to start gardening gardens trying to get into um or trying to find horticulture or gardening based podcasts so that's really cool what would be like your top tips for somebody starting their first their first garden in their backyard Ooh, okay well um the first thing is i tell them you know don't don't be paralyzed by analysis. So no, in other words, don't not do anything just because you're trying to overthink it. You just need to start, put that first plant in the ground, no matter what, you got to start somewhere. And if you just wait until you think you're going to get it perfect, you're never going to get started. So I always encourage people to, you know, just, just close your eyes and jump off the cliff and do it. Cause what's the worst case scenario that can happen? Your plant doesn't make it. Okay, fine. Now you're going to learn why it didn't make it. Cause you're going to try to figure that out. So the first thing is just do it, uh, to borrow Nike's tagline. And then the second thing <laughs> that is big for me, the two, the two, probably the two catchphrases I, I say maybe more than anything else when it comes to growing is, um, Feed the soil and let the soil feed the plants. So in other words, focus on building the health and quality of the soil, because if you do that, your plants, because they genetically want to grow anyway, if you create the best growing environment for that to happen, how is that not going to happen for the most part? And then on top of that, and complementary to that is um, put the right plant in the right place. And I'll tell you, Trevor, when I was uh, hosting uh, Garden Smart, that was the other show I did after Fresh from the Garden for three years, on PBS, we would travel all over the country and we would interview uh, the top horticulturalists in public gardens and, and big private gardens and, you know, the the places to go to see great horticulture in action. And so my job as the host was to interview that person. And I made a point 
with every visit I did, which was over 100 episodes, to ask them the very first question I would ask them once I had their attention was I said, what's the one thing you do to keep your garden and your plants looking good all the time? What's the one thing? You know, not two. I just want one thing. And almost every time verbatim, I would get the same answer from these people. And that was put the right plant in the right place. And then, you know, you only have to hear that once and understand why that's true to know that it is. And then when you hear it another 99 plus times from the top people in the country that are taking care of these things, you got to know it's true because you're hearing it from people all over the country, from north to south, south to east to west, and crisscross everywhere in between. So you know that that's a universal truth, just as it is to feed the soil and, and let the soil feed the plants. So those are three things right there. Um, and then uh, I would add to that, you know, once you get your plants uh, growing, uh, add mulch because that is a like a, a, a secret ingredient that does so many things to improve the quality of your soil and provide a better growing environment for your plant while cutting down on weed pressure and disease pressure and your plants are healthier. So therefore you're going to have fewer pests and, you know, on and on. Uh, and then don't feel the need to throw a chemical at everything. Um, Mother Nature has a great system in place. If you give it time and you kind of set these plants up for success, doing the things I just mentioned, your plants are naturally going to be healthier and more resilient. And then, th then you just have to come along and be proactive and just keep an eye on subtle changes. And so by doing that, by getting out in your garden and visiting it more often, uh, you can notice those subtle changes bec before they become big changes. And then you can address them with more benign solutions and, and problems, you can fix them easier. So that would be another thing. Um, and then enjoy it. You know, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself and don't worry about making mistakes because I believe if you're really going to be a better, smarter, more confident gardener, you've got to screw up a few times and, and don't look at them as failures or mistakes. Look at them as learning opportunities and then put your detective hat on and do your homework and find trusted advisors and sources that can help guide you through the process to figure out what possibly went wrong and then narrow it down and use your process of elimination to try to conclude what that was. And then I would say also on that subject of trying to do your homework and figuring out where to go to get the right information, there is so much information out there and it's unlimited on, on who can post what where now and everybody's a supposed expert. But I would tell people you got to put your filter on there because just because some website has a what appears to be a good name for their website like they're an authority on the subject they're not necessarily an authority they just happen to buy that domain and it sounds good but a lot of them are just information mills and they're hiring a lot of freelance writers who could have been writing about nuts and bolts the day before now they're writing about you know how to deal with powdery mildew the next day and they've never even heard of it now they're doing research themselves going back to websites that may or may not be authoritative. And so how accurate is that information? Maybe not. Maybe it is. I mean, I'm not dissing everybody, but I am saying you got to put your filter on there because you don't always know unless it's like an academic institution or maybe it's a trusted source like a botanical garden, like a Missouri Botanical Garden or Mount Cuba Center or New York Botanical Garden, where you know that the people writing the articles are the people that have are professionally trained horticulturalists, and they've been doing this for a long time. So you got to take that information with a grain of salt and consider the source. And I don't know how many of that is. That's probably seven or so, but maybe you can leave it there and, and that ought to get people started. Oh yeah, no, that's pretty good. Um, th those are all good tips. I'd have to say I'm definitely right now in the screw up phase. I've got a, I've got a little raised bed that I made, and we had a little bit, a little bit of success this year. We grew some tomatoes, some um, potatoes, and stuff like that. And so after just reading up on your website and your podcast, I'm gonna try to make a compost pile so I can add some good organic matter, yeah. add some, um, some mulch, which I've never heard of the mulch idea, but it's such a clever idea. I mean. What it regulates the, the soil temperature and it helps retain moisture, right? Mulch does it, so many things. Those are two things. So imagine mm -hmm. you, you've got, you know, wherever you are, you, you know, in your summer crops, you've got the sun beating down on that soil. Well, if you don't have something buffering the impact of those rays, baking out the moisture at that surface level, it doesn't take long for the soil surface to crust over and then it becomes impermeable. So even in a rain event, now the water's running off, and with it, it's taking precious topsoil, but the water is typically not penetrating down where it needs to go. So you've got runoff issues, you've got uh, soil degradation, you don't have any soil infiltration, water infiltration, uh, so, so you're not getting the water where it needs to go. 
And so that's just the watering part. And then you've got diseases that live in the soil that without mulch can splash up onto the foliage in a rain event. So now you've got diseases being transmitted up to the foliage through the raindrops, but mulch can kind of buffer that and act as an ins insulating blanket there. Many weed seeds need sunlight to germinate. So when you have that mulch layer on top, you're minimizing or reducing the amount of weed pressure because they're not getting the light they need. The mulch is keeping the soil temperatures cooler in the summer and warmer in the wintertime. Uh, it looks good. I'm sure there's other things, but uh, that's that's quite a few. That's enough for me. Oh, the other thing that's really important with mulch, when you use natural mulch, like you know rotted uh, leaves, for example, or finely ground bark or straw, as those natural ingredients break down, they're improving the soil, which we always are trying to do anyway. We're trying to get more organic matter in the soil because that's not there forever. We always have to add new deposits of organic matter. So a great way to do that while you're doing all these other things to protect your soil and the plants, as it's slowly decomposing, it's breaking down and making your soil better. So it's like a win, 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 win all the way around. And there's just nothing wrong with it. That's pretty good. Um, now, what about, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do um, some crop rotation in the summer. Yep. What would be your advice to where I can plant it right now in the raised bed and that way when I'm ready for a fall garden, the soil is going to be full of those nutrients that, are, that those plants are going to need. What would be your advice for that? Well, I would say probably, you know, if you go, if you go, if your summer crop is a cover crop, then mm -hmm. in the fall, you're just going to cut it back. You know, we, you could till it in, but you know, we're talking more and more no till these days. So a lot of times we're recommending that you just let it, you cut it back or you let it die back because you're using a summer annual and it's kind of dying on its own, but you just let, let every, leave everything in place because the roots are going to rot in place by all the microorganisms in the soil. That's going to improve the quality of the soil. So you've got more built-in organic matter. And depending on the cover crops, maybe it's uh, a legume. So you've got uh, you know more nitrogen that's been sequestered in the soil naturally. So you've got that to help your fall crops. Or maybe it's something that's driving uh, roots deeper into the soil, so you're creating greater soil infiltration, infiltration. So there's a number of things that cover crops can do. And so depending on the questions or the solutions that you're trying to solve for will determine what cover crops you use over that season to get your soil improved for the next season. But that's ultimately what you're trying to do with a cover crop. You sort of look at it as a green manure it, that's going to be a natural way to protect your soil and improve it over a season before you plant into that area the next season. So the other thing I was going to say about that, Trevor, is that um, depending on where you live and the solution you're trying to solve for is going to dictate what cover crops you use. And the best way to know what cover crops you should use, and maybe it's a blend top, oftentimes it is, is to consult with a trusted seed company that has that as one of their primary lines they can offer you is that they they'll be trained enough to ask you the right questions so that they can make proper recommendations for wherever you live to provide the cover crops that will um, accomplish the objective that you're trying to uh, grow for. Okay, gotcha. That all makes sense. All right, now I've got an off the wall question for you. We, my wife and I, went to Disney a few a few months ago, and we mm -hmm. bought one of those little um, I forget what they call. I think like the little micro propagation plants that they have there and we bought a dragon fruit and that thing is growing like crazy have you ever dr grown dragon fruit before i haven't i'm googling it right now because i gotta picture it i know i've seen it i just can't remember what it looks like yeah I, i'm i'm growing it right now and i mean i know very little up to next to nothing about growing dragon fruit and i've seen where they grow they grow them with these huge columns sometimes like in south america they'll have these huge concrete columns that they'll, they'll grow up and they'll like flower off and just have all of these little aloe looking leaves. So they look really cool. And I'm trying not to freak out. Like it's going to be absolutely crazy to take care of. So we'll see how that goes. I'll have to keep you updated on that one. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm not. I mean, I, I hate it when I don't really have a, a comeback for a question or a comment, but I've never grown dragon fruit. I'm not sure I've barely seen it. And I'm looking at pictures of it right now. And it's like, I don't think I've ever seen that. And it looks pretty big. <laughs> Because if the fruit is that big, like a single fruit looks as big as a bunch of bananas or a huge artichoke, um, that's a big plant. So good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> wow. it, it looks a lot bigger than I thought it would be. So it's it huge. Be a really good experience. Yeah, they're massive. 
Uh, now, going off of that, what do you enjoy growing fruits, vegetables, or just ornamentals? What, what's your favorite plant to take care of? I don't have a favorite plant because I love growing everything. I'm so enamored with anything that grows other than weeds. And, you know, the <laughs> truth is I, I actually I don't like weeds, but I don't mind pulling them. It's kind of a zen time for me, and I do it almost an hour every day just to – it's my kind of my little time away in the morning. Oh, but, yeah, it's – um. so anyway, that's another thing. But – I um, I do love my vegetable garden, and I'm in it every day. I grow year-round. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, so we can grow year-round, and I always love the challenges. And I've been doing this a really long time, and yet I do not mind having a, a challenge every time because uh, I always want to know what went wrong and how I can fix that or what is it that Mother Nature threw at me that I can't control but I can look out for next time, and how can I figure out a solution for that challenge. So my – brain is always being uh challenged uh and that's part of what i love about it so it doesn't matter if it's edibles which i love or it's uh native plants or ornamentals or um trees or shrubs or uh, it's anything i just love plants i'm fascinated by how they grow um and in nurturing them i i do have a i guess a little nurturing part in me that is just respectful of those plants and I appreciate them for, you know, what they were made to do. And I just try to help them along without getting in their way. I've learned that that can be detrimental. I mean, sometimes, in fact, more often than not, we can love our plants to death. And so I've learned to back off a long time ago, but at the same time, I certainly like having my hand in it a little bit with everything that I grow. And I haven't met a plant I don't like too much yet. Yeah, going off of weeds, I, I kind of like going out in the yard or going to our garden, just picking weeds. It is it is very very relaxing. What yeah. do you have any anything you use that's kind of organic instead of like Roundup or anything that kind of gets rid of weeds? Not not necessarily in your garden, but just kind of like around your yard. In my beds, in my landscape beds, or and mm -hmm. in my raised bed garden, in my pathways, and actually in my raised beds after I clear my garden of the plants and between seasons, for example, when the soil is exposed. In all of those scenarios, I have a favorite tool. Um, some people call it a scuffle hoe. Some people call it a winged weeder. But basically, it's on a long shaft. Uh, it's a long wooden handle at a 45 degree angle, basically. So you're holding it basically one hand on the shaft and one hand on the end of the shaft where there's another kind of a handle thing. At kind of at your chest level, okay? And then the tool itself is a stainless steel diamond-shaped blade. So it's like um, four-sided, but in the, in the shape of a diamond, if that makes sense. And it's just a good flat stainless steel blade that has the blade edge on all four sides. So what you're doing is you're, you're pushing and pulling it along the surface of the soil, just under the, uh, right at the root level, the surface root level of the weeds. And you're just slicing through on the push and the pull and if your soil is not too heavy, uh, it's like cutting through butter. You watch these weeds just melt away when you're sliding the blade just underneath the, the base of the weed. It's severing the, the foliage from the weed, and it just goes away. So it's a really quick and enjoyable instant gratification way of weeding. And so that's my tool of choice, and I have, I have used – maybe everything there is out there at least once as far as you know from the flame weeders to the um uh extractors to you name it but this is this is the thing that i love so much i actually have about four of them and um i'm very happy with those but even those as much as as much as i love those um it's hard to beat hand weeding uh, it's 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 not a fast process but um it's a sure thing <laughs> Gotcha. The the flame weeder sounds pretty cool. I'm imagining like a little flamethrower. Uh, it is. Well, you can get different <laughs> versions of it. You can get one on a small camping propane tank. You know, like you put in a little bun, a little uh, camp stove, and you yeah. screw it in, and you just light, and then it's on a shaft, and then so the the propane supply is up near your hip, and then the shaft goes down near the ground where there's uh, the flame part. And then you're just moving that along. And all you're doing is singeing the weed, and it's instantly breaking down the tissue. You're not trying to catch the weed on fire. You're just trying to raise the temperature of the foliage so you're breaking the cell structure of the tissue. And that doesn't take long, just a little quick brush over. Um, but for guys like you and me that really want firepower, 
they make a they make multiple versions, but one is on a like basically on a backpack where you strap it to your back and it's a much bigger tank, not quite as big as your your gas grill, but about as big as your back can handle. So you got a lot more firepower and you got a longer burn time. And that one you can do some damage on. So if you really want to get out there and put some put some weeds to shame, um, then you take that backpack flame weeder out there and the magic happens. Now, I'll, <laughs> now I will say, like on um, uh, tap rooted weeds, for example, even the flame weeder isn't going to necessarily guarantee that you're going to kill that weed the first time through because you know a lot of that energy is down in the tap root. So even though you may burn off the foliage at the top. You know, there's new growth. It's as long as that root is still viable, there's a good chance it's going to re-sprout uh, from the base, and oftentimes it does. So just you know, be aware of that. I have a flame reader, and I I lent it out, but I and I don't have it back yet. And that was a few years ago, and I haven't missed it, and I haven't asked for it back. So you know, they're fun to use, and they are pretty effective. But um, it's just another option. It's another tool in your arsenal. That seems pretty cool. I'm imagining like those really big flamethrowers from like Vietnam or something like that, where you have this huge 10 or 15 foot flame coming out the end. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, no, I was just going to say, I'm sure that's an option, but I don't think you're going to find that anywhere where we can order those easily. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if you bring that out in your front yard, the police are going to show up real quick. Uh, now, now, how important are climate zones going to be? I think I'm over here in Panama City, and so we're zone... 9a i believe so how important are zones for a home garden very important that goes back to right plant right place you know you may see something that you like and you want to grow but if it's not suited for your for your zone um you're not going to experience the success that plant is not going to thrive it it may be that that plant lives but that plant struggles the whole time and your results are going to be unsatisfactory it's not going to be what you had hoped it was going to be you're going to be discouraged and you may not know. I mean, if you took a plant that wasn't suited for your zone and you planted it anyway, chances are you didn't know that it wasn't suited for your zone, which me, leads me to think that you're probably not going to know why that plant didn't do so well unless you follow up and you try to you know, do the process of elimination to figure it out. So um, my advice to a lot of people, and especially the guys like me who don't typically read the tags, there is a lot of good information on those tags. And it it's worthwhile to read the information there, such as, you know, where does this plant thrive? Now, that said, a reputable nursery is not going to be selling you a plant that isn't suited for that zone. So let's just assume, usually, that the plants you buy in your local independent garden center are going to have plants that are suited for your area. That's a pretty safe bet. But if you're trying to order something online, for example, it may not be suited um, and hopefully there's something on that online order that's going to ask you where you live and make recommendations. But it's really important um, to to set yourself up for and your plants for success because the other thing, I know this is stating the obvious, but once you put a plant in the ground, it cannot move itself. It's up to you, which goes back to when I say put the right plant in the right place. A big part of that reason is unlike you and me, when we're in an area that we're not comfortable in, we can just get up and move typically. Plants, once they're in the ground, they're in the ground, and they're there until you move them or it dies. So knowing your zone and p picking plants that are suitable for that area is um, gets you started off on the right foot for sure. Gotcha. Yeah, the, I always overlook them, but every time I go back and see them, those tags are full of information like what zone they should be in, how often to water them, what kind of sun they need. So, yeah, a lot of really good information on there. Yeah. Um now, what if somebody wants to get started with a compost pile? What would be your thought process on that? I'm trying to convert um, like a Rubbermaid container into a little compost pile. So what would be your advice on that? Okay, so a little Rubbermaid container would be good to store some ingredients until you can get it outside. But to that point, before I go on, um, for compost to really cook down and become compost before you lose uh, interest or attention or patience, you need to get it up to a certain size, and, and generally that's about four feet by four feet by four feet. So you want a nice, what I call critical mass pile, because that's that's where you get a lot of microbial activity inside that can do what it does without being influenced by external forces, like whether too cold or too hot or too wet or whatever. Um, so what I would tell people there, because my experience with people that don't compost, that want to compost is the reason they don't do it. They get overwhelmed. They start to look into the process. They go online. They start reading too much. Some people provide too much information that makes it overwhelming, and it is intimidating when you start reading about 
carbon and nitrogen carbon and nitrogen ratios and greens to browns and you need 33% this and 70% this and it just gets so confusing but what i would tell anybody that's listening is don't really pay attention to that all you need to do is create a pile and it can be literally just a pile it doesn't need to be in full sun. You can put it in shade. Just find a place that's convenient for you that you're going to actually get to to deposit scraps from your kitchen after dinner. And I mean by scraps, vegetable and uh, fruit scraps, not meat, not dairy, uh, and not grease. So don't put um, meat-based products in your compost. But food, uh, plant-based products or cardboard or shredded paper, emails – you know, things like that. Those are carbon and nitrogen sources from inside the house that are important for um, building that pile. And from outside, it's your lawn debris, it's your grass clippings, it's shredded leaves, all of those things that might otherwise be thrown away or you might, you know, blow off into a, you know, under the bushes or something. Um, get those all in a pile. And you're going to have a mix of carbon based products and nitrogen based products. Those are the two ingredient options that you've got they're either going to be carbon or nitrogen and this is where people get bogged down in the ratios but i'm just saying don't just put in what you've got and don't worry about what's what and then you spray it with water once a week or so and you mix it up once a week so you get a turning fork or a broad fork or a pitchfork or a shovel whatever it takes for you to mix it up because the reason you do that is you need to constantly introduce air or oxygen into the center of the pile and you need moisture for the microbes to survive and function and to help biodegrade the uh, organic material. But there's just four components. You got the greens, which are the nitrogen, the browns, which are the carbons, water, and oxygen. And if you have those four things, and eventually you can build that up to three or four feet by three or four feet, and you turn it and water it, you're going to have in eight to 12 weeks, you're going to go from raw material that came from your kitchen or your yard to unrecognizable, beautiful, finished compost that you can use in your garden. And the beauty of that is it's the single best soil amendment you can put into your soil, into your garden, and it's free, and you keep it out of the landfill. So it's an incredible way to improve your soil and the health of your plants and 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 doing a good environmental thing in the process. I've seen a bunch of plans that it seems like if you want to make your own compost pile, that old discarded um, pallets make for a really good little, like you can make a box out of them and that way you can start a little compost pile pretty simply. Is that right? That is so right. I can attest to that because that's my method of choice for my composting system. And because you can typically find pallets for free, it's a great option. And you can just piece together like my three bin composting system consists of seven pallets, um, three three to create the chambers, you know, one on each end and one in the middle, uh, or two in the, yeah, two in the middle, and then the backs. And so you got seven, seven um, pallets. But the thing about the pallets that you need to be careful about, um, the way that they're treated, in other words, when they're used in shipping, shippers will, or pallet makers or shippers, whichever, could potentially spray them with a insecticide, um, which can be very lethal, and you have to be careful about that. Um, uh, methyl bromide is typically the, the chemical you're using, and that's stamped with an MB. It's supposed to be stamped with an MB to alert you to that because you don't want to use that in your compost pile. The other one is right. he, uh, heat treated, and it's stamped as HT to indicate that it's not chemically treated. It's just heat treated to kill the uh, diseases and pests on it. And the other one is just raw hardwood. Or raw wood, and it just isn't, it wasn't heat treated or it wasn't uh, chemically treated because it was just raw wood formed into a pallet. Now, let me just tell everybody you can't, you can no longer rely on the stamps on the pallets for HT or MB for methyl bromide because um, there are counterfeiters out there that are making pallets and stamping them. They're just, they're just having a stamp made for like HT, because what you're looking for is an HT stamp for heat treated, because that's the friendly kind. But that's not to stop a counterfeiter who has a methyl bromide or a chemically treated pallet from stamping it with an HT stamp. And now you think you've got a pallet uh, that is safe to use, and really it was chemically treated. So I don't know the solution for that. I think you got to find a reputable 
pallet provider if you want to take it to that level or find a pallet maker that's just got raw hardwood pallets. That's what I typically try to find. That way you know for sure it's clean and use that. So, you know, that adds a that adds a curveball to the process, but it's kind of important because the last thing you want to do is have a um insecticide laden pallet in your compost. The whole reason you're composting is to have this good organic soil amendment that you don't want in contact with a, a lethal pesticide. Yeah, exactly. I had no idea that that was such a big issue going on. Um, so the next time I go look for a pallet, I'll make sure it's got one of those on there or that it doesn't. Yeah. Um, that's crazy. Well, Joe, this has been a really cool conversation talking about all things horticulture and gardening. Um, if people want to follow you or get in touch with you, I know you've got you've got many avenues and how they huh. get in touch with you. Um, what would be a good place for them to find? Well, I would start with at Joe Gardener. So um, that would be my Instagram handle, my Twitter handle. And joegardener.com is the website. And actually, maybe that's where you start because there – there are links to the social media channels, and there you can access the podcast, the Joe Gardner Show podcast, which is over 100 episodes now, and we've interviewed a lot of farmers, for example. Uh, you know, the other thing that you're talking about with our show, yeah, we're a gardening show for sure, but I'll tell you, we're almost as much a small farming show as we are, you know, featuring gardens. There are times where we're, I feel like we're doing more features of small farms and farmers than we are gardeners, which is fine with me, but to me, they're very much related, you know, so um, that's why there's a lot of coverage on the on Growing a Greener World, our television show and our podcast to um, to agriculture, you know. Um, so JoeGardner.com and then the handle at Joe Gardner. And then just the one other thing is the television show, which is Growing a Greener World. So the website would be GrowingAGreenerWorld.com. Well, Joe, this has been awesome. I took a lot of notes, and for my fall garden, I'm going to follow them to a T. So I appreciate it, my friend. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me on the show, and um, I hope you have a good weekend. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. You as well. <laughs>